Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Guy Tourist. So here we've got a video with a little bit of a difference. Obviously you've got a different filming environment and angle from me here. But we're going to be looking today at the perfect size for the two-handed sword or long sword. Now obviously those can be two different things. Um, so we're going to focus really on the long sword in terms of the sword that is shown in most of the um, European fencing treatises of the 15th century really okay so what is the optimum size for a longsword now this is a question I get asked a lot and I see asked just generally actually um, and obviously the, there isn't one answer so the basic response I give is that there is no one ideal sword size for a person because clearly there are arming swords there are so-called bastard swords long swords and there are big two-handed swords, great swords, zweihanders, whatever you want to call them. Um, so there is a spectrum of sword size. However, if we look at the so-called longsword sources or treatises of the 15th and into the 16th century, we do see that there are systems um, that are uh, carry on through. They start in the 14th century with Lichtenauer and, and Fiore de Liberi, and they run through the 15th century and into the 16th century up to people like Morozzo. Um, and so we have a, a spectrum of sources that all do something similarly with a similar type of sword. So what we're going to look at really today is one particular source, um, which is from the late 15th century, um, the 1480s, by a guy called Filippo Vardi, um, as he's com commonly known, uh, Filippo di Vardi um, of Pisa. And we're going to look at his um, perfect sizing for a longsword. Um, and that is obviously specific to his source and what I want to sort of emphasize here is that that is the right size of sword for um, for his treaties and for his fencing uh, manual for his fencing system and we have to bear in mind that each treaties might have a different optimal size so the headline here is there is no perfect size for a long sword it really depends what system you're doing plus, obviously, your own personal body proportions within that system. So it's quite a fluid thing. Uh, it's quite a, um, uh, it's something that's quite open to it, subjectivity and interpretation. So first up, before we go into looking at Filippo Vardi's um, proportions for the longsword within his system, we're going to just look at a little bit of context because it's me and we need some context injected into this video. So to start off at one end of the spectrum, we have, for example, Fiore de Liberi, um, and we have a treaties. We have, in fact, in fact, four treatises from him. There are probably, in fact, definitely other uh, copies surviving originally, but we have four surviving known of. There might be others that turn up. Um, and it's very clear that his sword is a true hand and a half sword. Now, this is a modern term. It's not a historical term. Um, but uh, in its own time, this my, most people just would have been called a sword. Um, but we could perhaps call this also a bastard sword. Um, and most people these days will call it a long sword. Now, this is truly a sword which can be used in one hand or two hands. And in Fury's treaties, we clearly see it has a large sword section where it is predominantly used in two hands. But within that two-handed sword section, and he does call it Spada Dumani, he does call it the two-handed sword, Within that section, he does often use the sword one-handed, usually using uh, during grappling uh, closing techniques, but not always. But in addition to that, he does have a sword in one hand um, section, and that is clearly the same sword because we can see a large overhang of grip sticking out there. There's no suggestion this is actually a different sword. Um, so he uses the same sword in one hand or in two hands. Okay, so this is a bastard sword, a long sword, a hand and a half sword. Therefore, the sword can only be of certain proportions, only can be, be a certain length and only be a certain weight in order for it to be able to be used uh, even remotely effectively as a one-handed sword. So this is a sword which you must be able to use either in one hand or in two hands, which in modern terms makes for a relatively small or at least a relatively light and nimble long sword doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be particularly short because of course we've got one-handed swords which have 
quite incredible blade length, um, particularly in the 16th century. But even if we go back to the 12th and 13th century, we have some very large um, blades up to 40 inches on one-handed swords. So it doesn't need to be a short sword necessarily. Um, and we also see him using it on horseback, which again reiterates and emphasizes the fact that you have to be able to use this sword in one hand effectively. So it is not a true two-handed sword or great sword. It's not a sword that um, is almost unmanageable in one hand. It has to be manageable and not just barely manageable, but it needs to be effective in one hand as well. There is another factor as well, particular to Fury, where we see certain techniques where he has wrapped the person's arm, for example, in something called a ligadura mezzana or middle bind, and he is able to give point or thrust the person in a certain position. And if the blade were beyond a certain length, it would become very difficult to do that in the position shown in the treaties. Um, additionally, there are the guard positions as well, and the guard positions and the way that they're held. Uh, for example, uh, Dente de Cingale also show certain positions which would be more difficult with a particularly large sword, either with a very long blade or a very long hilt. So, uh, to conclude, there are several data points just within Fury's system which really indicate that he is using a long sword which is not above a certain size, not above a certain weight. Now, if we go towards the other end of the spectrum, not into the kind of fully, uh, fully kind of Zweihander or Spadone territory, because obviously that kind of becomes a different weapon. But if we go to the other end of the spectrum, into the 16th century, Fiore dates to around 1400 to 1410 in terms of the treatises. He was actually around since the 1380s. So we're talking about a late 14th century guy making treatises in the big, very beginning of the 15th century. Now, if we fast forward more than 100 years into the 16th century, we have a very famous fencing master called Achille Morozzo. And Achille Morozzo was one of the most influential um, fencing authors of his time. His treatise was published very, very widely. There are a surprising number of copies still surviving in museums and archives all over the world. And private collections as well. Um, and he published his treatise, um, The Opera Nova, in 1536. Okay, so we're talking about a good 120, minimum 120 years later than Fiore. And his system is connected in many ways to Fiore's, if not directly, it is at least from a common culture and contains similar guard names and similar reference points and some of the same terminology, technical uh, fencing jargon, basically. Um, because, of course, they're from similar cultures. They're both Italian fencing masters, so we're putting the Germans to one side just for now. And clearly he's using quite a different sword. Um, would we call it a Spadone? don't think quite. I don't think we quite call it a spud on it. It's not quite that big, but it is clearly a big longsword. So it's very evident that when we look at Fiore at one end and we look at Morozzo at the other end, that there is a very wide diversity of longsword, if we call them longswords, there is a very wide diversity of longsword sizes. Now, Filippo Vardi is interesting because he sits sort of between these two. Filippo Vardi is in time pretty much equally between the two, in fact, being about 70 years later than Fiore and about 50 years earlier than uh, Morozzo. Um, but remember that there are there are common link linkages here. It's not purely about chronology. It's not purely about tendencies over time. You can find small longswords in the 16th century and you can find big longswords in the 14th century. So it's not purely about long swords got bigger. Um, the fact that's not really the case. Um, however, what I would perhaps say is that the large long swords probably increased in frequency or how often you would encounter them as we go through the 15th century so that these large two-handed swords, larger long swords, uh, moving towards the, the stereotypical kind of 16th century uh, Montante and Spadoni and Zweihander um, types, they do become more common, we could say, in the second half of the 15th century, and they certainly become more common in the 16th century. Why? Well, that's, uh, that's a topic for another video that I'll deal with uh, another day. But um, what we can clearly see is that uh, Vardi in time is between the two, and also perhaps partly by coincidence, partly by tendency. He also seems to be using a larger sword than Fiore and probably or possibly a smaller sword than Morozzo. But let's little have, have a look and see what Vardi actually says 
and then we can actually see what kind of sword does that result in. So just very briefly, who was Filippo Vardi? Well, the short answer is we don't know for certain, um, but we do know that he made two fencing treatises which seem to have a close relationship with Fiore de Liberi's um, um, kind of tradition or lineage. Um, there's a lot of repeated language and common points of um, uh, reference within the treatise itself. It's possible that Filippo Vardi, the fencing master, was the same Filippo Vardi who was a governor of Reggio um, under Lionello d'Este, which is particularly interesting because the d'Este family, or Niccolo d'Este uh, III specifically, was who Fiore dedicated two of his treatises to. So um, we don't know. We don't know for sure um, whether that's the same person or not. Um, but what we do know is he made these two fencing treatises um, between 1482 and 1487. And at this point, I will refer you to the Wichtenau website. There's a link below to the Filippo Vardi page where you can read a lot more detail about Filippo Vardi. And you can also see his treatise, including an English translation of it and the images from it. Now, what I would point out is that for the purposes of this video, I um, decided to get a retranslation of the part of the text where he talks about the size and proportions of the sword. The reason I chose to do that is because I've worked on translation from medieval Italian uh, myself and also with Italian linguistic colleagues. And um, looking at the translation, there were some bits which I didn't think were precise enough or that I trusted enough for the purposes of this specific paragraph or section um, I thought that the translation was a little bit too liberal and when you're talking about proportions like this you really want to be very precise and make sure that you've got um, everything correct otherwise you could end up with very strange results now I was very very lucky to be put in contact with Domenico Ficera um, who is uh, a um, teacher at instructor at the Sala d'Arme Achille Morozzo um, in Italy and not only of course is he an instructor of Morozzo and various other um, Italian um, treatises but also he's an Italian and he um, translates things he's he's uh, knows that he's on top of the linguistics so I kind of went almost to the source I went to an Italian who understood the fencing terms knows the sources and also is an Italian who understands the language language as well um, and incidentally um, Saladami Achille Morozzo are a fantastic um, set of clubs it's not just one class all over Italy there's a link below uh, to them I've been over to Italy and done an uh, event with them in the past and uh, they're a great bunch of people and I know them from years ago um, doing uh, the event circuit back in the day and um, so a great great uh, organization so go and check them out if you're in Italy I highly recommend uh, training with them and um, Domenico was very very kind to translate this section for me so we're going to go through it here uh, with the aid of um, a couple of swords that I have with me here and we're going to try and work out what size sword is Vardi actually talking about? So first of all, I'll just do a straight read through. And this again is uh, Domenico Ficara's uh, translation uh, from Filippo Vardi. So chapter two, the size of the two-handed sword. The sword should have the right size. The pommel should reach under the arm as it is described in my writing here. I am again impatient to explain what to do if you want to dodge. The pommel should be round to stay in the closed fist and do this to not get in the way of the action. And make sure to use what I tell you, that the handle should be always a hands, that means a spans, uh, a span distance, um, who doesn't have this measure is confused. So that your mind is not deceived, the guard should be as long as the handle, the pommel together, so that is with the pommel together, so that um, it won't doom you. <laughs> The guard should be strong and fit for purpose with the iron wide and stretched at the tip, that means pointed, um, that can injure and cut properly. Write down and understand this last part. If you want to try the sword with the armour, make it able to cut four fingers from the point. That's a specific requirement for armoured sword. With the handle described above, with a pointy guard, and mark well what is written here. Right, so for a start, there are obviously some things there which don't necessarily translate into smooth, easy English. And there are some words which may be literal, but maybe not the word if we were producing a published English translation and not necessarily the English words that we would use because some things sound strange to our ears. But there's one important other factor to note. This was written in essentially rhyming verse, okay, a bit like a poem. So 
<laughs> in Italian, it sounds when you read it, it sounds kind of musical and it has a it has a role to it. You know, it has a tempo. In fact, Vardy talks about tempo quite a bit. Um, but when you translate it into English, it obviously loses that. So it does have some strange, um, uh, strange sound to the ear, I think. But let's break down actually what he's saying. So first up, he's saying that according to his system, the sword should have the correct proportions, okay, or size. It should, uh, to for his, to work the best in his system, the sword should also be correctly sized to your body. Okay, so those are two interesting things. If we only had that information, that is an interesting thing to know about his system. But one of the first things he says is he says that the pommel should reach under the arm. Well, what does that mean? Well, we presume, we assume, and most people I think would assume this, that it means that standing up, the pommel should come under the arm. Let's have a look at that. So I'm six foot one tall, about 184 centimeters, and I've got two long swords with me here. One is a windless two-handed sword. The other one is a Dynasty Forge bastard sword. Um, and we're gonna take the bastard sword first, which incidentally, you'll notice there's an Albion Ringek behind me. It's of roughly the same size as that. So this is what we might commonly consider a normal size longsword. It's about a 37 inch blade. It's typical proportions of the sort of swords that are very popular these days for HEMA. Now, if we put that point on the ground, you will see quite clearly, does the point, does the pommel come under my arm? Well, <laughs> it does, but what does, what does Vardy mean come under the arm? Does he, most people assume he means under the armpit. Well, quite clearly, that is very, very far from being just under the armpit. It is a long, long way under. It is technically under, but it's way, way under <laughs> the armpit. So we could, and most people do assume for Vardy, that this sword just isn't long enough. So let's pick up the longer sword here. And here we go. So um, let's move my cable out of the way. If we put the point on the ground now, well, actually, that's a little bit too long, isn't it? So actually what we seem to be talking about in Vardy is a sword which is longer than the typical long sword that most people in Hemi use these days, but is um, not as long as this two-handed sword. If I was about one inch taller, then that would seem to conform to Vardy's um, measure. So we're talking about a sword which is really quite, um, really quite a big sword, probably a long hilt, probably a long blade. He doesn't talk specifically about the blade, but he does talk specifically about the hilt as a whole. So that's what he see, it says about that. So Vardy says um, that the pommel should be round to stay in a closed fist. Okay, so let's just uh, pick up these um, swords. Um, first of all, this is a wheel pommel, okay, which I'm sure you all know. Wheel pommels come in various forms. The Albion Ringek behind me has a form of what's called scent stopper pommel. And the windless two-handed sword here has what's commonly known as a fishtail pommel. Now, none of these are particularly rounded uh, in turn, literally, you know, none of them are ball-shaped, but we do find ball-shaped pommels. In fact, funnily enough, they were particularly popular in England. Um, in fact, they were almost characteristic, uh, famously characteristic of English swords, particularly in the end of the 15th century and into the 16th century and beyond into the 17th as well. Um, however, within a 15th century Italian context, does Vardy actually mean ball-like? I'm not really convinced. He might just mean that the pommel needs to be sufficiently rounded and smooth such that your hand is comfortable on it. Okay, So he could just be me meaning to say that when the hand is interacting with the pommel, that it's comfortable. And with this pommel, it is. Okay, and in fact, with the fishtail and with the scent stopper, it is as well. So it could be that any of these pommels would be fine, according to Vardy, um, so long as they were rounded and not offending to the hand. Or it could mean that he literally means he wants you to have a ball-like pommel. And that is also possible because they did exist in Italy at that time. I mean, if we look at Vardy's illustrations in his treatise, there is some evidence that perhaps these are ball-like pommels. So maybe he is literally saying that. But there's a more interesting point here. People who do HEMA longsword spend a lot of time arguing on the internet over how to grip a sword. And one of the reasons for this is just like every other aspect of fencing and swords, not everything's the same. And a person studying um, one of the early Lichtenauer sources will probably disagree with someone who's studying Vardy 
because they don't tell you to do the same thing okay and this relates to many videos i've made in the past talking about the fact that fundamentally there's a lot of differences between the treatises and also there's a lot of differences between individuals and the people who made the treatises themselves of course were individuals so um, a lot of people who practice uh, modern test cutting will say you must grip the sword around the handle and not uh, and let the pommel swing freely. This is a very German fencing influenced thing. And some people might even say it's even a Japanese uh, cutting influenced thing. But the fact is that in European treatises, we do see the pommel being gripped a lot. OK, not all the time. And indeed, if you look at Fury or Vardy's treatises, sometimes the pommel sticking out at the bottom, but sometimes it's completely hidden in inside the hand. But what's really interesting to note is that Vardy is one of the European sources that we can immediately cite to say, well, look, Vardy specifically says that he wants the pommel to be comfortable inside the hand. So at the very least, he's got the hand partially on the pommel, and maybe he's got the hand completely on the pommel. So he is spreading his hands wide and using the full length of the grip. Now, Vardy also says that the handle um, should be a span's length. Now, What's interesting is we know that this sword is about, it's maybe a little bit too long, maybe about an inch too long, but this is about the length that seems to comply with his under the arm comment. Um, however, if we look at the hilt of this, I'm having to be somewhat uh, careful with how I handle this because it is a sharp. You can see quite clearly that this is too long by Vardy's measure. If I put this down for a second and grab the Dynasty Forge, bastard sword so this is the more typically sized long sword with this one again this is a sharp so i'm having to be somewhat careful that is close to a span okay pretty much uh, exactly now if we go back to um vardy's text for a minute um it says uh the handle should always be a span or hand um, and who doesn't have this measure is confused um, so that your mind's not deceived, the guard should be as long as the handle and the pommel together. So there's a bit of ambiguity there, isn't there? Because it doesn't seem to be clear whether he's saying the handle alone should be a span or the handle and the pommel should be a span. And But he does say that the guard should be as long as the handle and the pommel together. So that's a little bit confusing. Is he saying that this guard should be longer than the handle alone, but the same length as the handle or grip and the pommel. It's open to interpretation, isn't it? But what's interesting is this Dynasty Forge guard is actually slightly shorter than a span um, and is therefore definitely shorter than the full length of this. So this guard by Vardy's measure would seem to be a little bit too short. Um, if we go to the windlass two-hander, <laughs> this is, if I just pull out a tape measure here, this guard is 30 centimetres, just over, but 30 centimetres long, and the whole hilt is 33 centimetres long. So by that measure, by Vardy's um, reckoning, this guard is even a little bit short, even though it is, to me, quite a massive guard. So interesting, there's some ambiguity there, but the more troubling thing for me, I find, is that it suggests that he, if we do, if we do accept at face value the very first requirement that it comes under the armpit, then that's a long, long sword, but it's quite a short hilt. Um, and that's a bit strange to me, that would result in a very long blade. Now. Let's do a little exercise here. So let's make some assumptions, and these aren't necessarily certain assumptions, but let's assume that the grip and the pommel are a span long, okay? So this is, obviously there are differing interpretations of these words, but let's assume that the um, grip and the pommel are a span long and move up to here. If we assume that this entire length is under the armpit, so the entire length is correct according to Vardy, let's even subtract a little bit for the fact that this is a little bit too long for me. Bearing in mind I'm six foot one, so this is just doing it to my measurements. And let's move down to there. So that would put the cross guard should be coming out of this sword here for Vardy's measure. Now, if we take our tape measure again and we put the tip on the tape measure and measure up to here that would give us a whopping 47 inch blade or um, nearly 120 just under about 119 centimeters that is 
very, very long blade for not a very long hilt. So, as is often the case with medieval sources in many, many different ways, um, I think that <laughs> I think that there's um, some complications with interpreting this. Um, we have to change the assumptions and play around with the assumptions, and I'd very much welcome you doing sharing your views on what this text um, results in, the proportions of this sword. I should also um, cite Peter Johnson here. So Peter Johnson, as many of you will know, has um, a geometric way of calculating the proportions of swords, medieval swords, and has found that a lot of original medieval swords conform to these uh, geometric patterns that perhaps have a relationship to church design and church building architecture. Um, so how does this measure with that? I think it probably doesn't. I think this probably leads to a sword which has a relatively short health compared to the blade length and but a relatively long guard. But it'd be interesting to get Peter Johnson's um, input on that. Um, so at face value, to conclude, at face value, Vardy's measurements to me seem like they're a very big long sword with a very long blade, but not a very long hilt. Kind of like a normal long sword hilt on an extra long blade. Very interesting. Um, I don't know if other people have noted this as well, but um, and I don't even know, obviously, I don't know if that's correct. That's just an interpretation. Um, right, so finally, we are going to look at the bit of text where he talks about the armoured sword, and he also talks about the cross guard. Um, so he says that the guard should be um, strong and fit for purpose, with the iron or steel uh, being wide and stretched at the tips, or pointed at the tip. So he specifically wants a pointy cross guard, and you could say, well, why not? We know that the cross guard's used in close combat, and he says that can injure and cut properly. Um, and then he says, if you want to fight in armor, then you need to make um, the uh, make it be able to cut four fingers from the point. And this is repeated in the armored section later in the treaties. Now that's an interesting thing um, because he's basically saying that your sword doesn't need to be sharp for the full length. Um, he says you only need to make four fingers, so a few inches. What is that? That's about. Sorry, I'll use I'll use metric for those of you who there we go. So it's for me that's about eight centimeters or three and a half inches, three and a quarter inches. Um, about that much uh, towards the tip has to be sharp. So essentially, it's a sharp point and no more than that. Um, so there we go. Um, it's an interesting on several levels. There are many interesting things to take away from Vardy's text, and it's one of those rare, and this is very rare in 15th century text, where he actually talks about the size and proportions of the sword. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope this has been interesting. I'd love you to share your thoughts below. Uh, thank you very, very much again to Domenico Ficara um, and um, the Saladame uh, Kilimorozzo. Um, check out the links below. Um, and also check out the Wicton our page where you can see more, learn more about, about Vardy and look at Vardy's treaties. Um, so thanks to both of those resources. If you're not subscribed, please do so, because you can get more videos like this then. And um, give us a like, and I'll see you really soon again for another video here on Scholar Galilee Tour channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like, and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.